Good day and welcome to today's webinar about Switzerland and Greater Zurich as a location for companies in the drone industry. Thanks for your interest and taking the time. My name is Reto Siedler. I'm the Greater Zurich Area's Head of Communications and Marketing and I'm going to be your host and moderator today. Let me start with a brief introduction to the topic, to our region and our organization. In recent years, Greater Zurich has developed into the world's leading location for the development of core technology and high-end applications for drones. Startups from our regions are developing very successfully. Wingtra and Otterian, for example, each raised 10 million US dollars in capital recently. Drone companies from abroad have chosen Greater Zurich as a location for R&D and for the international marketing of their product and services, for example, Martinet and Airmap from the US or Unique and EWOT from China. Drones are already performing complex operations in Switzerland on a daily basis. In this picture, we see a Martinet drone used by the Swiss Post to transport laboratory samples between hospitals in the cities of Zurich and Lugano. Chris Anderson, founder of the American drone company 3DR said, Switzerland is the Silicon Valley of robotics. I'm confident that our webinar will confirm this great testimony. But our region is not only a prime location for robotics and intelligent systems, but also for life sciences, information technologies and other tech sectors. As a global champion in innovation and talent attraction, and with Switzerland's business-friendly and stable environment, Greater Zurich offers international companies real added value for their strategic expansion. As you can see on this slide, the city of Zurich alone is home to countless Fortune 500 companies and R&D sites of global technology leaders like Google, Microsoft, IBM, Oracle and others. Our organization, the Greater Zurich Aero Limited or GCA, is the official investment promotion agency of our region and is organized as a public-private partnership. On the public side, we are supported by the governments of nine Swiss states or cantons. And on the private side, we work with 27 companies, as well as four major universities, including the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, and the University of Zurich. Both carry out cutting edge research in the field of robotics and drones. GCA is a business concierge for companies looking to grow internationally. We guide them through the ecosystem of Greater Zurich and network them with companies, research institutes, incubators and authorities. We provide advice re with regards to R&D incentive programs, site tours, work permits, taxes and so on. All of our services are free of charge. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us should you have any information need. Before we kick off with the presentations, let me do some housekeeping and acquaint you with what you see on your screen. To the left is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you see the presentation slides. To the right is the control panel with the questions field at the bottom. We would like this webinar to be interactive. So please type your questions into the questions field during the presentations and we will answer them at the very end of the webinar. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website tomorrow. You will also get the recording into your mailbox. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce two absolute industry experts. Kevin Sartori is co-founder at Autarian here in Zurich. He holds a master in robotics from ETH Zurich and an MBA from UC Berkeley. Kevin had his first touch point with the drone industry in 2008 when he was researching optimal control algorithms as part of the early PixHawk team at ETH. After working as a strategy consultant for the Boston Consulting Group, he moved to the Bay Area in 2014 and joined 3DR as senior product marketing manager for SiteScan. In 2017, he founded Autarian, the world's largest largest open source drone software company together with Lawrence Meyer. Kevin will portray the drone technology ecosystem of Greater Zurich and put a particular focus on the collaboration between academia and industry. Our second speaker is Andreas Lamprecht. 
He is CTO at AirMap, the world's leading airspace management platform for drones, headquartered in California. In his role, Andy is responsible for the company's research, development, and product management efforts. Since starting at AirMap, Andy has co-led the global development team from the company's European bases in Munich and Zurich. Before joining AirMap, Andy spent a decade at Audi, helping shape the future of location, mobility, autonomous driving, and high-definition maps, while also defining their technology strategy. Andy holds a PhD in automotive engineering from the Technical University of Chemnitz in Germany and is based in Munich. To answer the question why AirMap has chosen Zurich as its main location in Europe, Andy will present the Swiss Use Space Project, a pioneering initiative in the integration of drones into European airspace. But now I would like to give the floor first to Kevin for his presentation. We are all very excited. Um, please, Kevin. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Reto. I'm putting up my slides. And uh, you so first of all, thanks um, to the Greater Zurich Area for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, be presenting the ecosystem of drones in the Greater Zurich Area. I would love you to I would love to present you the the reasons behind that, behind the growth. And um, as Reto said in the introduction, I spent three years in the Bay Area working for the largest drone manufacturer in the US, Sudi Robotics. And two years ago, when founding Atarian as well was confronted with the question, okay, where, you know, where do I find my company? And I've done that in Zurich, and I would love you to, to guide you through the presentation with, with an, an entrepreneurial mindset, um, because I as well went through the same decision-making process. So first, um, quick touch point on what a technology ecosystem is. The uh, Oxford Dictionary says that it's an interconnected and self-enforcing independent network that combines um, creators and actors that innovate products and service tech. This includes both large companies that have products in the market and also smaller startups that challenge the status quo. It includes a strong network of providers that provide components, parts, and the technology itself. Also, it's, they need a um, leading research hub. They need a talent pool, of course. And finally, a regulatory framework. And we'll see how important that is in our space. This regulatory framework as well includes taxes, labor laws um, that make um, location interesting for business to establish. So how does the ecosystem in Zurich look like? Let me start by highlighting the universities or the research institutes, starting by ETH Zurich, which is considered to be the MIT uh, of Europe. That's where most of the research in the drone space takes space today in Zurich. That is followed closely by the University of Zurich, which is really side by side ETH. But as well, we have two University of Applied Sciences that are really important to the ecosystem. Those are placed in the neighbor cities of Winterthur and Rappersville. We have a strong ecosystem of Swiss companies. Those are both smaller startups that bring innovative technologies to the market like Wingtra with um, their mapping drone, like Verity Studios, which is the leading provider of drone shows in the world. But we also have larger, more established players the provider of GPS modules to virtually any drones that you see out today, and Sensarion that is providing airspeed sensors. And finally, we have a growing number of leading international companies that decide to establish um, an outpost in Zurich. Those are companies like Sony or Unique, which is the second largest drone manufacturer in China. And we also have AirMap, we'll hear more about them from Andy, and Matternet, which is a leading provider of drone logistics. So what are the reasons um, that 
founders decide to establish their companies in Zurich or international players uh, are relocating to Zurich. Um, doing my research, I found those six um, factors. First, of course, is the world education with ETH really leading here. But it's also important that there is a strong network of University of Applied Sciences that bring talent that is more practical to the labor market. Second, that is the international competition among those um, universities. And here, from my experience at ETH Zurich, I saw that the, the, the multiple departments that were working on drones, the computer science department, the, the mechanical engineering departments, all had drone programs. And in their small worlds, they were competing against each other. Third, um, we have the talent pool that in Zurich is very dynamic. As Redo explained in his introduction, uh, we have a number of leading companies as Google, Facebook, Microsoft that have R&D and offices in Zurich. Google's second largest office in the world is in Zurich and counts thousands of employees. Those companies, um, after some years, you know, after corporate life, some of them employees might, might grow tired of corporate life and might move to place, brings their knowledge with them. And that makes uh, the ecosystem in Zurich really strong. Fourth, um, that's the growing support for funders, both at universities, by universities accelerators and by private accelerators, but as well by VCs, I see a growing infrastructure for, to support founders. And I will mo to, we'll talk more about this point later. Fifth is the progressive regulation, which in a new technology as drones is really important. Um, Andy will go more into depth on this particular point. And finally, last but not least, uh, Zurich is the birthplace of PX4. Also more to that point later. So discussing about the infrastructure to support founders. What I saw before I left for Silicon Valley five years ago to now is um, a considerable change. First, I see more and more organizations that support founder becoming mature. They are supporting founders on different areas. What is really interesting to me is that um, the, the current mindset has, is being changed from a technology push where founders are looking for a solution um, for their technology to solve compared to now where founders are starting with the final problem and are trying to find a technology that solves that problem. Also, um, I'm really happy to see accelerators at universities that increase awareness that a career for an engineer doesn't have to be solo in tech, but can also be as an entrepreneur. Second, I see a growing network in venture capital with Lakestar and Index Ventures, which are some of the most successful European VCs. Um, Switzerland has really home um, of experts in that field. We also saw both a triple in the amount um, and the size of funding in Switzerland, which grew to 1.2 billion in 2018. 43% of that was invested in Zurich, which uh, makes it the largest hub in Switzerland. And finally, also the rounds um, increased in size. They're more, more than tripled in the last four years. And that also means that more and more there is the um, start, startups can avoid the value of death, which is basically the difference between, or the time between the initial seed founding and the next round. Third, I see more and more focus on software products, just focusing on, on core hardware or deep tech technology. There is more focus on software, and that makes uh, the business more and more scalable. And finally, Due to the recent IPOs, for example, of Ublox and Sensirion, um, this ecosystem starts to become self-enforcing. Of course, we're still far away from ecosystems like Silicon Valley or London, but 
really see uh, that becoming self-reinforcing because the established founders that exit come back to the ecosystem, bringing, bringing in their knowledge and their capital. Next, um, PX4, as I mentioned, is as well a key component or catalyzer for our industry. PX4 is the autopilot for drones, and the particularity about it is that it's open source, which means that the source code is freely available on the internet. Um, you can download it as a developer, as a company, and you can edit it adapting it to your particular use case. These two things, one, that it's open source and openly available, and two, that it's modifiable by their adopters, make it one of the most used software stacks in the drone industry. And depicted here are some of the companies and players that use it. Those range by, of course, many companies in the, in the Zurich area, um, like Unique or Wintra but as well by international large players like DHL or Amazon Primer. PX4 was founded in Zurich by Lawrence Meyer more than a decade ago. And over the course of um, 11 years has become one of the de facto standards in industry. In 2013-14, first products started to come to the market flying with the software. And in 2016, uh, it became part of the Linux Foundation, which is the leading foundation in open source that makes sure that the software remains open source and that the governance is democratic. In 2017, we found Altarion, uh, more to that point later. And in 2018, we reached more than 400 developers that on a daily basis, work at the code, improve the code, and, and make it the successful software stack that, that we know today. The particular part of it is that the core team is based in Zurich. So more than 50% of the core improvements to this global software stack come from companies based in Zurich. Also, um, Zurich is the place where this um, ecosystem of developers holds its largest developer summit. And this summit is happening next week. Um, it's the largest engineering drone summit that we know uh, with over 200 attendees. And if you're interested, you can follow the link below to register. We still have uh, some, some left seat. So if you're quick, you're able to register. Finally, before I come to the takeaways, I'd like to introduce you Altarion, which is the company I co-founded with Lawrence Meyer. X4 as Linux for drones, Altarion would be the Red Hat. That means it's the company that stays um, behind the ecosystem, supports the ecosystem, um, builds and contributes the code to the ecosystem, and supports player adopting it. Today, Altarion has grown to be the largest open source drone company um, with over 45 employees based in Zurich. We also just recently opened our LA office to be closer to our US customers. And as you see from um, the, the, the small logo cloud, both small players, but as well large players like G Aviation are customers of ours. We're being elected as um, the hottest or next global hot thing in Switzerland by the Digital Economic uh, Forum. And we're backed by top US and European investors um, that give us an international reach. What we do is we build the complete software operating system for safe and reliable drones. Our software powers the drone itself, but as well helps the operator to execute missions safely and helps companies using drones to monitor their fleets, making, making sure that they perform, that they stay safe, and that the data collected generates the meaningful business outcomes that they hope to do by using drones. 
Good. Finally, quick takeaways. So we have seen that Zurich has grown into a strong network of both manufacturer, but as well tier one and tier two suppliers to the ecosystem, and as well service company, companies making use of the hardware to provide business insights. We've seen that the ecosystem has reached a size that is self-enforcing, both talent coming from established companies like Google uh, and from universities fuel the ecosystem, uh, bringing new and competi competitive talent to the drone industry in Zurich. PX4 and Altarian are the catalyzers in the industry, providing the core component, which is the operating system, to the manufacturers. And finally, we see exemplary collaboration between the different stakeholders, the universities, the companies, um, but as well the regulators. And I think Andy will explain more on that in his presentation. So final word is that Zurich has become a leading ecosystem, a leading location for core drone technologies. And we're seeing more and more US, but as well Chinese companies moving here to leverage the system. Perfect. Um, I've come to the end of the presentation and I think I can give the word to Andy for his part. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, can you guys hear and see me or see yes. the screen rather? Yes, all fine. All right, perfect. So uh, thanks again uh, for uh, throwing over the ball. Thank you also, Rito and Great Zurich Area, for the opportunity to present. I'm very glad that Kevin covered already lots of the parts about the Zurich ecosystem from you know talent and hiring and tax and funding perspective, because then I can focus more on the uh, what what my company is doing, uh, UTM services, and how this is important and and good to actually uh, develop in Zurich. Um, few uh, one slide for introduction. Airmap is a also well not not so small anymore. <clears throat> Software startup. We have about 75 people right now. Uh, the companies with those logos have all invested into Airmap. Uh, we decided like a year ago after initially having had an office in Berlin uh, in, in Europe as our European headquarters to, to shut this down for various reasons and then go into more of a decentralized uh, organization form. But um, Zurich and, and, well, in all honesty, there's a few more people also outside of Zurich, but still in Switzerland, <laughs> has, has, been, has become the, the European headquarters, so to say, for Airmap. And I'll, I'll explain wh why that is. Um, it's kind of a you know, high-level introduction to, to the drone industry. You've seen the, the early history of PX4 and the now 11-year-old time span. Really, when things took off was about 2014, 15, when uh, you know big Chinese manufacturers made the technology very uh, good, basically, and, and cheap and easy to control. And so we, we had uh, a lot uh, of use cases being developed for various different applications, not only flying recreationally, but you know now it's, 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 it's taken control or drones are being used in all sorts of enterprise businesses, but also a lot of public safety applications for firefighting, for police, for search and rescue, for insurance purposes. And um, <clears throat> the next, really big step of uh, of the industry will be what is called advanced UAS operations, uh, where you are not limited by the way regulation currently is, is responding to increased levels of, of threat or hazards, uh, which is to basically limit the type of the operation. Right now, everything that is kind of higher risk is, is not allowed because the only tool that regulators have is to say, well, the operator of the drone is ultimately responsible for everything that 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 is happening, and so in order for the op <coughs> I'm sorry, in order for the operator 
to be responsible, he needs to see the drone. He needs to fly in visual line of sight. And, and then there are even more limits when it comes to um, uh, going over the airspaces that are closer to, uh, for instance, airports or, or heliports. Um, and so if, or, or flying over people, another restriction. And so if you want to circumvent that, uh, that hurdle, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of safety comes into play. And UTM or USpace is, is a way to, to orchestrate this and, and resolve this and distribute the liability, so to say, between the operator and companies uh, that would provide services for the operators. Uh, this, unfortunately, is very complex because low altitude airspace is very complex. You have all sorts of uh, uh, implications <clears throat> that are sort of all also happening for the classical manned aviation, but they don't really play that much of a role. So just to pick some examples of this slide, schools, I mean, you, you would think, okay, why, why is schools important? Yeah, because I mean, typically all those drones are, are not certified, right? They are imported as basically toy machinery. And then um, if you want to operate them over a city where there is a school and there might be lots of children playing outside, then this becomes uh, a risk because you, you don't really know how you mitigate the safety concerns of this drone not hurting someone when it eventually falls down. Um, now that doesn't mean that it always is a, is a risk, but it's a risk that needs to be managed and, and an easy way to manage this is to not fly over a school uh, if you can avoid it. Well, for that, to, to do that, you need to know where the schools are and, and that requires a map. And this is uh, complex because unfortunately there's not a global data provider for all the schools in all the different countries. And this can get very complex because regulation is quite complex. And if you compare, uh, uh, for instance, in, in Germany, there is a, a lot of items or a lot of properties that you need to stay a hundred meter at least away from, from power lines to a train station to waterways to uh, all sorts of things. Um, and, and for the for the operator, which uh, in many cases, you know, can be a 14 year old kid who just got a drone uh, for, for his birthday. Yeah, how, how is the kid supposed to know all of that? So <clears throat> low altitude airspace is complex, um, but through data and services, there, there's a way to, to make it easier. And, and our philosophy is that it starts with a digital twin of the airspace. A digital twin is very much an, is a, is a, is a, a modern world coming out of the IoT space, uh, primarily where you represent something that's digital with a set of data and a set of services to um, basically provide insights about um, what what you can do with the world. So in this case, you know we need lots and lots of data, and and I put some screenshots of various parts of our. UTM platform services on the slide. Uh, you see on the top left part, uh, flight flight planning uh, in, in, in 4D basically, where you can have volumetric flight plans and geographies and depending on where that is, it intersects with uh, low risk or high risk areas of where also manned aviation participates. There's also uh, things like national parks that need to be obeyed. This is basic, by the way, uh, uh, in, in Geneva. I think where you have um, um, the, the basin at the far end where also the, the big water fountain is, is uh, partially a, a national park. So, um, but it's only from the shore until the middle of the lake. So if you kind of know what you're doing, you can actually fly there. Uh, if you avoid that, that particular flight plan that is uh, showed here would however not be, not be legal. Um, uh, then if you go clockwise around here, you see, uh, uh, some of one of our applications that kind of um, shows what other data might be relevant before the flight, but also during the flight. You know, they were, were, aviation is all about introducing multiple layers of of safety mitigations, and so it starts before the, the flight when you when you plan the flight according to not flying too close to an airport, for instance, or not flying directly over people or staying away from helicopter operations, 
but then also during the flight there could be some situation that changes or or needs to be adopted and so we we actually update in real time all activities that are happening in the airspace on a second by second basis um, and uh, and we do this together with the in Switzerland, I should say, we do it together with the Swiss ANSP Sky Guide, um, who is using our platform to manage drone flights. Uh, right now, um, starting in, in two locations in Geneva and Lugano, with a digital um, system for getting access to airspace, which is very much similar to the system that is already in place in the US across um, many different airports. Um, although it, it, it's a little bit different as well. <clears throat> so the, on the bottom left, you, you kind of see what the air traffic controller in the tower is seeing. There's these uh, runway approaches and uh, five kilometer to the runway zone, which is where the responsibility of providing services for deconfliction of air traffic is with the air traffic controller, no longer with the operator. Right? So. Um, th that's an it's an important difference, and this, uh, these tools give uh, these software solutions give the uh, traffic controllers the tools to actually do that. Um, and um, for in, in the middle section of the left part, there is a what we call is our is our rule management system because we we do this actually on a on a global level. And luckily, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, there's not so many rules in Switzerland that actually need to be managed. I mean, if you compare the, the sheer amount of rules that exist uh, from different countries and different uh, regions, then, then Switzerland is actually pretty light. Um, they, all the rules make sense, however. It's, uh, it's uh, not very prescriptive. Right? For instance, in, whereas in Germany, you might have 20 different rules that, that forbid you uh, to fly over you know, hospitals and police stations and parks and power lines and blah 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 in switzerland it would just say you know don't don't hurt anyone i don't fly over people and then how, how you do that is, is up to you um but it's uh, that's a difference between uh, uh performance or risk-based uh, regulations versus uh, prescriptive ones that are very much uh, prescribing you every detail of the operation um, on top of those uh, data services are are then uh, on top of this data flows are then services built into the platform, and uh, here's a list of them. You can also <clears throat> see them if you go and, and there's a link later in the presentation. If you go to the homepage of the Swiss regulator, uh, the, the name of this is FOCA, Federal Office of Civil Aviation, and you search for U-Space, you will find uh, what is called U-Space concept of operation. And there they have all these services uh, described in, in what they do and uh, who they are for and what benefit and what high level functions they provide. And so that, that's that's what AMRAP is doing. We implement this. Um, it, it's like, a, you know, the, the CONOPS, the concept of operations is, is somewhat like a, a mix between a standards document and the regulatory document. Right now it's not it's not legally binding, but it's kind of the working assumption. And then there's multiple companies who implement that. Uh, to provide use-based services across Switzerland. All of what uh, AirMap is doing is available via APIs and SDKs. That's why also a number of those companies that uh, Kevin showed on the map are actually using AirMap services inside their products. So you, you don't need to necessarily use the AirMap mobile app to know what the airspace looks like. You can also use the Wingtra ground control station, for instance. It'll also show you how the airspace looks like because their APIs are integrated with our APIs, just to give one example. And then we built a number of solutions on top. So that's how we actually then make money. So we, we then sell these solutions, software solutions to different um, stakeholders. We license uh, a number of um, those airspace management tools to airspace authorities like air navigation service providers and, or in some cases civil aviation authorities. Uh, we have some solutions that are kind of specifically targeted for the vertical of, of public safety authorities like firefighting or, or polices. And then there's a rather big segment on um, enterprises and um, 
and other solution providers. Um, but it's kind of early stage for this market because you know, all of the limits that we still have <clears throat> in terms of what kind of drone operations you can uh, you can do. So there's a lots and lots of um, movement happening in this market, um, but uh, hopefully great potential for really enabling the drone programs of uh, of many different enterprises and, and sort of providing services that go way beyond the um, what we see currently, which is really around fleet or asset management. Um, so AirMap is, is more around reducing the risk of operations and not so much about uh, the, the fleet, the pure fleet management aspect of this. Um, just a snapshot <coughs> about our global activities. You can see that there is a lot of stuff happening in um, uh, in the US, of course. This is what our, what our home market is. Um, we have a number of programs with the uh, Federal Aviation Administration and, and NASA, but then um, since a while have been really focusing our attention a lot on, on Switzerland, actually. Uh, we, we might not have a super high number of employees in Switzerland uh, as of yet, but we're focusing like 80% of our resources on, on activities that are, that are happening in Switzerland on, on a global level right now. Um, and, and then there's some more stuff in Japan and Singapore. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what, why Switzerland, what is so, what is so special here. And I, and I wanted to start off by basically listing the negatives. Yes, it's not part of the EU. There's a small market share uh, compared to other on, on a global scale. The cost of labor is rather high. Um, so why would a small startup that not necessarily has a whole ton of revenue right now go ahead and, and invest in in working in switzerland so much well um because of those things so first of all there's a there's a use space implementation program so this is very much um i only know of really two places the us and switzerland that that has this it's a government-led and, and initiated implementation program where um, where implementation efforts are are kind of orchestrated um, between the regulators or the civil aviation authority, the government, the air navigation service provider, different technology providers, drone service providers, drone manufacturers, UTM service providers, and of course the users of such. And so um, together with the the, the basic advocacy or the policy direction of, of everything being risk-based and everything being an open marketplace, it, this is perfect. Right? You don't have like the government saying, okay, this is how you need to do things. You need to work with that company and none of this is allowed because we don't have a formula in our recipe on how to approve it. In Switzerland, it's the other way around. They say, well, everything is allowed as long as you can prove that it's safe. And we don't care with what company or in, in, in what co um, constellation you are you are working here. As long as you can, can prove us that it's uh, safe, then, then yes, you can conduct the operation. And this has a lot to do with the second column here, the SORA. Um, this is a, uh, Switzerland is very much home of, of the SORA. SORA is, is short for Specific Operation Risk Assessment. It's a, a methodology that was developed um, or is now developed within within uh, JARUS, that is, the, which is a club of around, I think, 60 something by now, um, civil aviation authorities around the world um, who are trying to kind of standardize the way to characterize risk of an, an unmanned aircraft mission, and um, and and this is uh, is almost is like all <laughs> is not at all focusing on um, existing regulations like um, do 178 type certification what you what you usually have in aviation you know if you buy an airbus then of course you need to do it of course according to a lot of uh, certification design, design criteria because you're gonna eventually fly over a lot of people and you're gonna transport a lot of people uh, well, so that's good, you know, it increases the level of safety quite a bit. Well, but for drones, you know, this is a, these are, I don't know, $500 to $5,000 drones almost exclusively. 
and uh, the safety is introduced by lots of different things. Uh, not only that you design your aircraft according to the design criteria of a heavyweight commercial aircraft. And so that you, you can very much do with uh, with Sora. And, and Switzerland is one of the few countries in the planet where you can go ahead and actually can get then uh, approved to do those missions. And there is lots of of unique type of missions that, that Switzerland is is conducting. Um, you know, BV beyond line of sight um, delivery operations across Zurich with uh, commercial purposes or blood delivery. Um, um, we have weather drones that fly up to I think 4,000 feet in in altitude. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> search and rescue organizations that fly 12 by 12 kilometer grids for uh, finding people that are somehow lost in the mountains. So there's a lot of very interesting things that are definitely not possible in many other countries on the planet. Um, we have Skyguide, the air navigation service provider, uh, who sees uh, drones and use space as a, as a welcome disruption. That's how they always call it. Um, not only in, in drone technology, but also in their core business of air traffic management, they have invested quite a bit into moving away from kind of very investment heavy on-site IT technology to more something that resembles more the a cloud-based approach where you, where you are independent between, uh, you know, where the operator sits and uses the technology to where it actually runs, which physical machine. And this continues to, to the same with, with use space and, and managing drone traffic for drones around the airport, um, which is also seen as kind of the, the, the first steps into the new dimension of uh, also air traffic management. Everything is digital. You no longer rely on voice communication. Eventually, those planes or air taxis are going to fly autonomously. There might not be a pilot on board. Uh, there might not be an air traffic controller who is managing this manually. This might be done by a machine. And so use space is kind of the first step for, uh, for, for moving into that direction. And then of course, coming back to the, to the ecosystem that uh, Kevin was mentioning, yes, there's lots of users and that's perfect for, for us, but also for Skyguide and the regulator, because only through a, a testing and iteration based process, you, you can actually learn and improve the safety. Uh, <clears throat> when you are when you are in a in a complex environment and, and lots of safety critical aspects that depend uh, uninvolved third parties or that impact uninvolved third parties, it's it's not binary. You have to sort of be able to test and, and iterate and so the fact that we have a lot of those companies in Switzerland who are willing to test and iterate, the fact that we have the regulator who has the appropriate staffing to do that, the fact that on the air navigation service provider side we have the same situation and the fact that also from a political or, or, or social perspective drones are very much seen as, as a positive force of Switzerland. Um, you know, it's not that there's here and there are also people, I suppose, who complain about the noise uh, and see drones as a risk, but the, the, the vast majority, um, and we see this through, through the backing that these activities have on a, on a parliament level as well, the vast majority in, in Switzerland are seeing drones as a, as a positive, basically business opportunity and societal opportunity for Switzerland to uh, reinvent themselves uh, and be a global leader in this. Um, I have a few more pictures about how this looks like uh, and then I'm, uh, we're open for questions, I suppose. Um, uh, this is uh, the Swiss use base. You can see, you know, this is the tower in, in uh, Lugano, I think, with the, with the use base dashboard that is used for approving flights. You can see this little map on the top of the screen indicating the safe altitudes for operating drones um, so it's no longer binary you know if you're outside or inside the five kilometers to a runway or if you're inside a controlled uh, uh, airspace area then you cannot fly now this is very much fine granular on a <clears throat> 300 by 300 meter grid it tells you the safe altitude and where to where to fly a drone and then if you want to fly above that altitude it needs some coordination with with manned aviation but it's also not impossible 
Uh, the system is called LANT, Low Altitude Authorization and Notification Capability. It's another strength of the, of the Swiss approach. They're not reinventing the wheel here. They're adopting something that has been done successfully at over 700 airports now in the US and adopting it to, to Switzerland. Some adoption was necessary because, for instance, you know, Switzerland famous for the terrain. So the measuring altitude of drones is actually not that trivial. <laughs> and so the, this, uh, these uh, altitude values were kind of adopted to the situation with lots of uh, changes in terrain and the way that drones actually measure altitude. <clears throat> um, and then some, some more adoptions are, were also made. Um, but in, in principle, it's the, the same mechanic. Um, there is a small video about this. I don't know what does our timekeeper say. Two and a half minutes. We, I guess we can watch this. Uh, you can watch this offline. Uh, it's a, it's a, an overview about what those services do. So I, I'll not play it within the presentation now. But it's uh, it's just on YouTube. So if you Google for uh, Swiss U space uh, on YouTube, then you'll find it. So thank you. That was uh, that was uh, my overview. And um, handing back to Rito. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you very much, Kevin. That was really, really uh, insightful, very interesting. Uh, in, the meantime, we, in the meantime, we have received a couple of questions from the audience. They uh, cover several areas, such as research, uh, regulation, manufacturing. Um, so I think the first question is for you, Kevin. It's, um, could you specify a bit about uh, the research labs at ETH um, that do uh, core research in the, in the drone field? Um, maybe when, when doing so, you could also elaborate a little on, uh, on how uh, universities and industry collaborate. How does it work in, in practical terms? Absolutely. I think three departments at ETH come to mind. One is the computer science department under Professor Polyface. That is where uh, PX4 comes from. Um, there is the Autonomous Systems Lab by Roland Siegbart, which is really focused on the end applications for drones. And finally, we have the Control Dynamic System and Control Department with Professor D'Andrea that is really strong in all control systems for drones uh, for very quick um, movement and reaction. Um, in terms of the collaboration between the industry and NETH particularly. I think there are several ways in which they can work together. Um, one is to sponsor directly professorships or PhD students. There is um, the possibility to, to sponsor um, a chair, for example, or to sponsor specific students doing research. Um, the second way to collaborate is to support a PhD student in um, industrial use case. So have the PhD students work at your location, at your company, on a common problem. Um, and finally, there is the opportunity, almost like a VC, to support um, recent graduates in helping them establish a startup. And here the vector for that is the ETH Pioneer Fellowship um, that already has brought to, to the ecosystem a number of drone startups. Okay, thank you very much. And there is a manufacturing question. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, ask, I'll, uh, I'll have you answer this as well, Kevin. What country produces uh, the highest number of drones? Is that uh, the US, is that China, or even Switzerland? Uh, what countries have what role in the, in the, in the drone world? Uh, absolutely. So if, if, you know, to answer in a... Of course, China. Um, no, we were, with their incredible Kevin, manufacturing capability. Kevin, sorry, you were broken for like two or three seconds. Uh, can you start from the beginning again so that everybody can hear your entire answer? Absolutely. So in a nutshell, the answer is it's China with their incredible manufacturing capabilities of consumer-like products. So that's the majority. But if you look at specific targeted use case, specifically in enterprise applications, you see more and more 
systems coming from the US and from Europe, um, those would be larger systems that would cost above 10,000 Swiss francs and up. Um, but yeah, in absolute numbers, uh, that's for sure China. And the numbers are, numbers are in the millions. Okay, the next question is a regulatory one. How is Switzerland affected by upcoming EU regulation on drones? Um, Andy, I think this one's for you. Uh, yeah, so, um, so in theory, Switzerland is not part of the European uh, Union, of course, and, uh, and so th there's no, not an automated sort of uh, 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 carryover for, from those regulations. However, there are bilateral agreements in place between uh, EASA and the Swiss authorities. So in, in fact, um, it's not an automated carryover, but it's a, an, an, an on-purpose carryover. <laughs> So now that this week, or actually this week, yes, the, the, in the European journals <clears throat> from the European Commission, the new Implementing and Delegating Act were published for harmonizing drone rules across EU. Switzerland is, is adopting them one to one. So it's very much to be considered in part of the harmonized EU drone market space. Exactly. Okay, and then there's one more question. Are there any examples of complex drone operations that are already possible in Switzerland? Um, Andy, I think you're best qualified to answer that as well. <coughs> so apologies. Yes, yeah, so I actually um, mentioned two of them already. Um, um, so if you go to, for instance, uh, the weather service Meteomatics, which is a Swiss uh, company, they use uh, high altitude weather drones. Um, it is, it's well, it's interesting from the first uh, aspect to know that Switzerland doesn't even have an altitude limit for drones. So in theory, you can fly all your uh, recreational drones as well as high as you want, provided that you can still see them. Right? It's, uh, you still have to be able to visual, uh, visually see the, the drone and uh, they conflict it with other aircraft. Um, however, there are some... Uh, of those high altitude weather drones that have specific equipment on board to go really, really high. And, and that's that's uh, happening across Switzerland on multiple different locations on a repeated level uh, over and over again. So that's certainly very cool. Um, then, um, well, probably the most advanced uh, operations really uh, uh, globally is, is the, the Swiss Post example, um, collaboration between Swiss Post and Maternet, who are doing um, blood delivery between, well, in most cases, it's a hospital and the blood lab of a hospital. Um, there have been thousands of flights in, in Lugano and, and Zurich as well. Everything perfectly safe, despite uh, some recent, uh, 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 well, there were, not crashes, but uh, safe flight terminations, let's call it like that, where basically the performance envelope of the drone was, was met, um, which is uh, just for, for some context here, is perfectly fine, you know, when, when the car was invented or the space rockets were invented, uh, that doesn't happen without sometimes uh, those things uh, falling out of the sky. Uh, but the uh, safety mitigations that were put in place did their job, and so in none of the cases uh, was there anyone hurt. Uh, actually, this was quite far away from anyone or anybody getting hurt. Um, but it but it shows that this call walk run approach is is actually a, a good thing to do, provided that you don't uh, hurt someone in, in the steps between. Um, there's also maybe something notable on top: SenseFly. They have a, as another Swiss company from the western part of Switzerland in Lausanne. Um, they have a product which is very similar to the, this picture that you had on the first uh, on the first uh, slide of the Wingtra drone. Well, I shouldn't speak too much about similarities here, but it's it's a fixed wing drone and it's very lightweight and it it has a, a performance authorization to always fly above people. So this is very much unique and doesn't is not replicatable in in other places of the planet, um, but it's uh, it's in Switzerland uh, perfectly fine to fly this drone over people, and even if you fly want to fly it over groups of people, there there are ways to doing this, 
And it's not limited to only the manufacturer to do this, also the customers of those drones in Switzerland can do this. So just a few examples of, of how Switzerland is really pushing forward in terms of allowing more advanced operations. Great. Two more questions just came in. Um, I ask you to be very brief and answering them. Um, for the remaining questions, um, uh, we I, I ask the uh, participants to be uh, patient. We will contact you after the webinar um, so that you get your answer, but the time allows for only two more um, questions. Um, Kevin, what are the primary differences between Altarian's Enterprise PX4 and the open source PX4 release? Is it mainly changes supporting the data collection environment and re reliability testing, or are there any other major changes? Good question. So the main two differences are, one is PX4 is continuing to change day by day. Um, Aterion gives you a release of PX4 that is stable and further tested for enterprise use cases. And second, and that's the fundamental difference, is that PX4 is only the flight control software, whereas Aterion is that plus the whole operating system. So the software on the companion computer, the software on the ground station, and the cloud suite to monitor flights and to do device management. Okay, and then the last question. Uh, within the delivery and logistics segment, where do you see the largest business opportunities looking two to five years ahead? Who wants to take this one? Well, it's uh, hard to hard to read the future, but um, uh, but it, it sort of tells a story looking at the um, by just looking at the US delivery industry, I don't think there's any logistics provider who's not doing a drone program these days. You have Amazon, you have FedEx, you have UPS, you have uh, Google, Wing. Um, I, I think from a, <clears throat> from a kind of safety perspective and, and uh, if, you, if you take this with any measure for kind of uh, a measure of how easy these operations would be to, to, would be to be carried out. It, it, it's it's easier to not have random point-to-point -point connections. So when you have fixed routes between a, a, a start and a destination, and you repeat those all over again, and then form a network with them, maybe from one point to the from flank to A to B to C back to A back to C, so that kind of thing. If you build up your operations like this. Then it's it's easier to have the safety aspects under control compared to uh, applications where you have maybe one warehouse, but then you want to deliver to any any possible locations. Um, so, so maybe that gives a, uh, a little bit of an indication about what what is easier or, or harder to do. That would be my point of view. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we are running out of time, so um, we will answer the remaining one or two questions um, after the webinar by email or phone call. Um, I would like to conclude uh, today's webinar by extending once more my thanks to our speakers, Kevin Sartori and Andy Lamprecht. You've done a fantastic job providing such interesting and valuable insight. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank our audience for your interest in the Greater Zurich area and for taking the time to join our webinar in such high numbers today and also uh, to ask uh, interesting questions. Um, we would appreciate if you answered the short survey that is going to be sent out together with the recording by email. Should you have any other questions, please contact us by phone or email. We will be happy to advise or support. The GCA webinar series will resume after the summer break. We will inform you about the next topics and speakers via our website, email newsletter, and social media. So goodbye for now and see you at our next webinar. Thanks and goodbye.